service. It got so dark outside. <laughs> Good to see everybody here and we hope this all passes through while we're safe in here and and everybody gets out dry. If you want to take a minute to, actually I just want to say how much I enjoyed that video. <laughs> Brought back my high school years and singing along with that. So whoever picked that one out, thank you. All right, I'm going to start with birthdays today. Son, today is Evelyn Anstead. Tomorrow is George, uh, Linda's mother-in-law, and Logan Reed. And Friday is my son-in-law, Dustin Garrison. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> uh, keep saving your best choice labels. Our special offering for this month and April almost there for camp scholarships blessing box it's going to be busy school's out this week so while you're shopping just grab a few extra things for the blessing box would be great uh, coming up in a few weeks we you know we have council meetings church meetings and then this weekend was a big graduation weekend for a lot of us we had uh, has washburn rural already happened Oh, it's oh. indoors? Oh, good. And has Haley graduated? Next Friday. Next Friday, okay. Central Heights had theirs, and Santa Fe Trail had theirs yesterday, and Cloud County was Friday evening. I watched it remotely, so um, best wishes to all this, these graduates. Are there any other announcements? Yes. Come on up.
So uh, I don't know if you guys know or remember. Um, I'm part of the KO Council, um, and we met yesterday in Wichita. It was a good time. We, you know, reunited because we've been meeting virtually like forever now. It seems like, and yesterday was the first in-person meeting, so that was good. Um, I can tell you that uh, there is um, a new, somewhat philosophy coming to uh, the council and um, the website that uh, the council has, or the KO has, uh, to be more resourceful to smaller churches and rural churches because uh, that's what KO has the majority of. And so uh, we're, we're going to revamp the website to be more uh, user friendly and to actually be able to get people places to to you know, get resources if you need a, a liturgy or if you know, need to know how to do this or so on and so forth. So that's good. The other thing that might be uh, even more ex exciting for some of us is that we decided that we are going to open up to be the church grants again this year and also the technology grants for this year. So if our uh, church here on the hill has some needs that we think that we might be able to put, get a grant for from the KO that um, is going to be announced um, probably within the next month. So I don't know what the amounts are going to be, but you know sometimes every little bit helps. Um, I know there's some projects that we're looking at or some projects that we might need to look at that might that might help. So um, Lorraine still goes uh, is going. She's at an out by Hayes today preaching at some small congregation. Um, we uh, we decided that relationships are important uh, this last meeting and that we need to do better as a uh, conference to reach out to everyone and make sure that everyone knows that even though one of the big things that we were talking about with the um, website is that although the conference is welcome and affirming, we're more than that. And so it's uh, realizing that, you know, we're also helping those that uh, are less uh, fortunate as far as being able to find you know, good housing or being fed or, or um, health care, child care, whatever the case may be, is it is. So um, we'll be hoping that others will notice uh, that there is more involved instead of just, um, you know, this is us. So anyway, good things are coming. Part of it is because we have a new council uh, minister, you know, but um, also life changes and things change and you know you have to kind of evolve with them or get stuck so anyway d asked me to give you a snippet thank you eve glad we have somebody there who's somebody in our group who's there and so you can bring that information back to us so thank you i did see an email that linda forwarded about a, a white camp In August, I got, uh, where all the church kids can come down there and have a day at White Camp, and you know there'll be a worship service, I believe, and and then you're just, uh, you know, we're gonna do a potluck or something, and then kind of do your own thing. So more information to come to that since it's August, but I thought wouldn't that be fun? We haven't done that for a while. Just carpool down to Council Grove and enjoy that beautiful camp. Also. Uh, I got another email and it said that uh, the registration had been closed for the camps this summer and they have opened it again for another couple of weeks, I believe it was, it gave, it gave a day uh, for uh, additional registrations if anyone's interested. Good. And no late fees. And no what? No, no, late, no fees. late fees. Oh, nice. Do we have anybody? Is Trent going? Do you know Bessie? Trent is going. Awesome. So he's already registered? Perfect. Awesome. All who are able, please stand for the call to worship. Celebrate our God from the plains to the mountains. Celebrate our God from the waters and hills. Sing to our God who designed creation. 
fill the air with song to the one who painted the world with love. Let us praise our God, the author of grace. Let us worship our God, the composer of joy. And our opening hymn is number 17. Please join me in the invocation prayer. Basking in your presence, Holy Creator, we celebrate your name, your grace, your love in this space. We proclaim our excitement that we, together, can glorify your name through sharing your love. May this moment be the start of a new chapter of our love for you and our love for our neighbors. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture readings this morning, the first one comes from Psalm 104, chapter 104, verses 124, 1 through 24. Sorry, having a little technical difficulty up here. Found on page 554 in the Old Testament of your Pew Bible. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent and set the beams of your chambers on the water. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundation so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment, the water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they could not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow 
between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quenched their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle, the plants for people to use. To bring forth food from the earth, the wine of gladden, to gladden the heart. Oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for settling. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lion roars for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In the wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Our second reading comes from John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love each other, just as I have loved you, also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for the people of God. So I was doing some research this week on the liturgy readings that we had this morning, and I found something interesting as Eve and I were having a conversation. I said, you know, what part of the Bible I'd like to name my sermon opening a window because I think that, you know, when Jesus left us and left the disciples behind and was separated from them, it was though a door closed for them, like a vault, like a wall. Something came up and they couldn't get past it because he was gone. But there had to be some way of communicating. And I remember the old saying, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And I said, well, maybe it's a window into heaven and that's what we might look at. Well, some research, thanks to Google and Wikipedia and a few other, uh, I'm sure, super well-researched projects, uh, I found out that the wisdom of God that we regularly use as a dialogue for that came from a musical. <laughs> and I know Rebecca's a huge musical fan, and a lot of you are uh, into music, so Maybe you can tell me where this came from. It's from the sound of music. So Maria wanted to be a nun. The Reverend Mother tells her she must first go spend a few months as a governess, taking care of seven children. Wonderful movie, The Sound of Music. She sees this as an unnecessary diversion and pauses on the way out and says to the Reverend Mother, when the Lord closes a door, somewhere he opens a window. There's your scripture for today. <laughs> but we use it in a lot of different ways. And there are a lot of different things that we can look at this week. But I was reading through some material and thinking about the different ways in which doors close and how we're able perhaps to see a window opening for us. 
but not often is it so immediate. There's a lingering period in between, a time when we have to work through something or, or process what we have lost or what has changed for us. Sometimes we get to be part of that discussion and that conversation about changes, and other times they come to us suddenly, and we have to wait for that window to open. So I have some stories to share with you. There's a widower, he's only 65, a young man whose wife has died. He paces from the kitchen to the living room to the master bedroom to the kitchen again and again. The funeral's long over. The neighbor's food has been eaten. The dishes return. Family members and close friends have gone home. He is alone in a house full of emptiness with his broken dreams of a happy retirement. Not even an echo of his wife's laughter haunts the space. Only her absence haunts him. He feels desolate. A mother hangs up the towels in her daughter's bathroom. Clean for the first time in years, it seems. Only a week ago, she and her husband moved their daughter into a college dorm room. Many of us will feel that this fall as changes occur for us. Only a week ago, she and her husband, they had shed tears when they left her there because they believed it was time for her to begin her great adventure through life. But when they returned home, they were too exhausted to notice the difference without her. But now the house is neater. The contents more in order. It is full of emptiness. The mother sighs and is keenly aware of the absence of her daughter as she feels the pain and loneliness in her heart. And as she settles those towels onto the shelf neatly and tidy, and turns off the lights to her daughter's room. A kindergartner wakes up from a long Saturday afternoon nap he took accidentally. When his mother sent him back to his room after a morning of frustrating wants and demands. It is the quiet that awakens him. He's used to the house being full of noises of his older brother and sister and his parents and door slamming and music playing and voices laughing and balls bouncing and water running and those are the sounds of his happy childhood. But the silence is invading him. His home is at dusk time, and something new for him, the quiet. He walks from room to room shouting, Dad, Mom, Joe, Claire, but no one answers. How is he to know they're in the front yard looking at the neighbor's new car? He only knows the absence of those he loves and for the first time in his short life, he feels a house full of emptiness and tears begin to roll down his cheek because he can't find them. These are some scenarios that I read and felt were appropriate for us because, you know, we've never had to know what it was like to lose Jesus in the physical sense. But Jesus was preparing the disciples for this very moment, for his absence, for the quiet without him. They were still a group. There were still plenty of them. There were still plenty of people to minister to and talk to. But their leader was gone. And we see in the last days when he was with the disciples, and then Judas left to do what he had to do. And Jesus said to, almost to himself, now the Son of Man has been glorified. He turned to his disciples and he said, little children. He was nurturing them and trying to prepare them for the inevitable. I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And I, as I said to the Jews, I say to you now, where I'm going, you cannot go. He's telling them about his leaving and then his compassion and his caring for them because they have been a part of his life for so long. He knows that being absent from them will be strange, but he's trying to warn them. 
even to protect them, because he knows they cannot fully comprehend this meaning and what is to come. We comprehend his meaning because we know all too well that Jesus was crucified on the cross, put in a tomb, and rose again three days later. And yet we've never had to be missing him physically. His absence only points more to how absolutely completely we may find our absence of God for ourselves. Because if Jesus is absent, then God is absent as well. Jesus was the closest anyone could ever come to God. So if Jesus is gone, so is God. And we're stuck in what St. Ignatius of Loyola calls desolation, a place of emptiness. I don't know if you know much about Ignatius, but he's the founder of the Roman Catholic Society of Friends, otherwise known as the Jesuits. As a professional soldier in the 16th century, he actually was wounded and wasn't able to return to his military duties. And in his time, in his convalescence, he mourned the loss of his physical strength his physical prowess, his ability to be the physical man that he was previously. Now what was he to do that he had lost his ability to lead soldiers, to be at war with other human beings? Through his time of anxiety and fear and despair, he found God. And often in desolation, like Ignatius, we feel that God has left us to fend for ourselves. But by faith, we know that God is always with us in the strength and power of grace. But at the time of apparent abandonment, we are very little aware of God's presence in our lives. We experience neither the support nor the sweetness of divine love. There's been a lot of conversation recently in the media about mental health issues. We know that Naomi Judd recently passed away at her own hand. And it's sometimes the famous people that we see about their tragedies at the end of life, and we just don't understand. We don't understand what haunts them or what despair they're in or desolation. But we know that the human condition is such that when we are alone and in desolation, we don't feel as though we're connected to God. And that type of desolation often deepens when we are at a loss for the people that we love, people that we care about. Whether it's through death or divorce or other natural changes in life, these things seem to conspire at us at one time and another, utterly alone. We actually feel the awareness of our isolation feeling forsaken. The one we love is absent. God is absent. But what are we to do in such times? You know, I know a lot of times that we talk, and especially this time of year, as we are working through the Easter season, we know that Jesus has risen. We know that there's beauty in the air. We know that the flowers are blooming. We know that the rain is coming. We know the sun is going to shine. We know that there's more to look forward to. But if we are at an impasse in our own lives, where we can't see what that future looks like, where we can't find that open window, what are we to do? It's often called the wintry sort of spirituality in a book by Martin Marty called A Cry of Absence. And he wrote it after his first wife passed away. He says more people are People more keenly alert to the absence of God than the presence of God throughout most of their lives. People who know that summer always ends and that death of winter too quickly takes away what is lush and green and sunny. There are more and more of them because they don't feel the connectedness to God.
These are the people who will not accept our cheerful platitudes about the sun coming up every morning. We know that in this life, there are people who know how distant God seems. From the people of the Sudan, where people are starving, from Ukraine, where soldiers and civilians are dying, from prisons where people are locked away from hope and compassion. These are the people who remind us that Jesus once said, I am leaving and you cannot follow, and took with him out of the world the very presence of God. But he left us something. He left us the Holy Spirit to fill us he taught us that we are supposed to love one another. He doesn't put his absence and our desolation on the table and then just walk away. He has to offer us something. To be sure, a little later in his discourse, he talks about the advocate, the helper, who will come and teach the disciples and remind them of what Jesus said, who will testify on their behalf and act in the world on their behalf. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not the first word that Jesus has to give in the face of impending desolation. No, the first word he gave was a new covenant, that you love one another. His first word is a word about holding on to one another. To be quite honest, when we're in desolation, caring about others is not our first impulse. When we're feeling isolated, our first urge is to hold on to that feeling of abandonment, the sense of grief that comes with it, or to kick out at God or those who come close to us to try to comfort us. We don't always want to love someone else in the moment. We want to hurt. We want to feel the pain, and we may want to hurt others. But Jesus will have none of that. He says, Love one another as I have loved you. He makes this commandment not only to counter our self-destructive tendencies, but to show the world that even in our pain, we are still his disciples. We are still his friends. He makes this commandment so that we and others might know that absence, even in the seeming absence of God, is not the last word of winter or summer. Love is the last word. His love for us, our love for one another, and for the world that he so loved. The psalm reading, in some ways, doesn't really seem to connect to the rest of the conversation that we're having today. But if we think about it, God has created all things. Do you believe that God wants the animals to suffer? Do you believe that God wants to close down the birds from flying? God gave them as a gift to show us the beauty and the light in the world. And he gave us other beings to prove to us that we are his beloved. For if God cares for the sparrow, if God cares for the flowers, and the trees and abundance and gives them life and lifts them up. How could he not love us, his greatest creation? He does. God loves all of us, each and every one. There aren't just three or four different types of flowers. We see daffodils this morning and some daisies and the lilies on the other side. God created a plethora of wonderful things to remind us each and every day that we aren't alone, that even though we don't see Jesus, Jesus is with us. He fills us with the Holy Spirit to give us the opportunity to work through those days of despair and desolation when we are so separated from him. And as a congregation, we need to live out that discipleship with one another. And I will tell you that not every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, do you all feel happy and glorious and want to go dancing and singing, even if it is to the sound of music, right? 
we know that we have those days of darkness and pain. Each of us experience different opportunities for sadness to enter our lives. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, or losing a job, or moving, or becoming ill and having or having a family member with Alzheimer's or someone that we need to take care of. It comes so suddenly to us. And yet we know somewhere along the way there may be hope that we can come out of that despair and desolation. So let's see what happened to the three people in our story at the beginning. At last, the widower I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon returns to church. The church that he loved and his wife loved and through her passing, he now stands ready to share his grief and to let others be a support to him. The empty nest parents adopt a student at a nearby college and welcome him into their home. And the little boy, he hears his parents' voices on the lawn outside, throws open the front door and runs to his mother and hugs her and is comforted by her. Remember, he hadn't been such a little angel earlier in that day. But when she came missing, he realized the love that his mother had for him. And he needed her. He needed to be loved. He needed to be seen. And in this beautiful month of May, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the earth. We remember that there's those among us still wandering in what we would call winter, looking for God looking for loved ones, and finding only coldness and death. May we offer them steadfast, patient love. And if we ourselves are among the wintry sorts these days, may we not remain behind the closed door. Let us find an open window and feel the breath of God in the air surrounding us. If nothing else, take in a deep breath and smell the flowers and know that there is a God that is greater than the moment of despair that we're in. May we receive God's love, and may we be the commandment that Jesus gave to share God's love with one another. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Turn in your hymnals to page 44. Thank you. 
Now it comes a time to lift up our prayers and concerns and our joys. If anyone has anything they'd like to share this morning. Is Trent's uh, choir traveling? Are they doing that soon? Do you know? They did some traveling. I don't know whether they have more or not. Okay. Uh, the graduates, the high school graduated yesterday. Okay. All right. I didn't get an update on that. So, and we know that Pat was performing yesterday and had tea with her granddaughter. So prayers for. Appreciate her being able to be here this morning. I spoke with Marlene on the way in this morning, and she's feeling better. Her pink eye is finally clearing up, and she had a, another hiccup with that. But today she said she's feeling better, can see fine, didn't want to drive because of the rain today. I want to also uh, keep in mind that her nephew is much better, and he and his wife are actually camping this weekend, which is great news. Prayers for Evelyn Ann Stat. You know, her brother passed away, and then his funeral was on Monday in California. So um, just prayers for that family and reaching out to them. And also uh, keep Denise, her father, and her family in our prayers as well, as well as anyone else who isn't here this morning who may be traveling or have needs that we don't know about. And all of the unspoken prayers that we need to uplift this morning. I'm sure there are plenty. Let's have a moment of silent prayer. God, we thank you for spring and the hope of warmer, longer, brighter days. Thank you for the coming of growth and life and birth. Thank you that things are coming awake in the world. This is what our calendars say, and we do see some signs that it's real. But we also still struggle with the residual layover of winter. Now we ask that you bring into reality all that belongs into this season. Your word says that we will have provision and hope and joy and health and loving relationships here and now in this life. We ask that what belongs to in the season would come and be actually practiced in our lives. We hope in you and in your promises. We hope in the gift of spring. But most of all, we hope in your son Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, give me thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Tithes and offerings can be placed at the front of the sanctuary. The March off, May offering is one great hour. No, okay, we're in May, and uh, I need to put a line through that there. Camp scholarships, yep, yeah, in May. <laughs> and also remember to continue with all the great gifts that you bring to the blessing box. Priests, rise and join me in the doxology.
Let's join in singing Walking in Sunlight, All of My Journey, page 336 in your hymnal. God, we were given the great commandment to love one another the way you, the Christ, the Spirit, loves us. And yet, the way we love becomes conditional. What events have distorted our view of divine love? How can we return to a simple but radical way of loving? You transform our hearts. You work with us to understand one another and you create an earth that reflects your heaven. And through these things we learn that love is the greatest of these, that you have commanded that we love one another with all our hearts, as we love you, God, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now it's time to say goodbye to God.